Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Currently, our guest of honor is Dr. Uma Srikumaran from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Dr. Sri Kumaran is an associate professor of orthopedic surgery in the shoulder division at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. He currently serves as the shoulder fellowship director and chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the Howard County General Hospital. He graduated from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and completed his orthopedic residency at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and his fellowship in shoulder surgery at Howard, Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's a master's of business administration from the Johns Hopkins Carey School of Business and a Master's of Public Health from the John Hopkins and Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's interested in clinical outcomes and value analysis in shoulder surgery. If you've noticed, Dr. Sri Kumaran has delivered a couple of lectures on our channel and it's already reached a huge audience. And today it's my great honor to bring back Associate Professor Uma Sri Kumaran for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Ma. Thank you, Atesh. Uh, good morning and uh, good evening. Um, thank you for having me. And today we'll be speaking on the subacromial balloon spacer. So my disclosures are on the AOS uh, website. And we, I did serve as one of the principal investigators for our site at Hopkins for the multi-center trial related to the subacromial balloon spacer. So first, massive rotator cuff tears are really the problem this subacromial balloon is attempting to address. And as Colin and others have described massive rotator cuff tears are quite varied in the classification and have a number of proposed surgical solutions. So hold on, I don't know why it's auto advancing here. So the question really is how do we match uh, the different surgical solutions to these varied patterns? And you can see that they're quite different in terms of how much involvement of the anterior rotator cuff, the superior rotator cuff, and the posterior rotator cuff. So where does the balloon fit into all of this? So first of all, what is the balloon uh, exactly? What kind of device is this? I'm having some issues with this advancing all at once. Okay. Hold on. Hmm. All right, let's try to get through this here. So the balloon is actually a device that starts out rolled up and it gets inflated with uh, the normal saline to fill it up to its final final size. This is an illustration of the device in the subacromial space. So it can be inserted through a small lateral arthroscopic sized uh, portal. So as you can see here in the video uh, of a standard massive rotator cuff situation. The steps of the procedure are simply to do a debridement, arthroscopic debridement, remove the bursal tissue and develop a space in the, over the humeral head. So you can see the device is inserted typically from laterally. It's in a sheath, that cannulated sheath is retracted. You can see the device being deployed now and filled with normal saline and it fills up the subacromial space. And it, how much you can reduce the acromial humeral interval depends on how much you inflate the balloon. It's important to get that part right, but you can see it functions very simply here as a humeral head depressor, potentially in that subacromial uh, space. So this is a, a live view uh, of the procedure. From a posterior view, we see again, the device from a arthroscopic viewpoint retracting the cannulated sheath. The device is there in a rolled up form. And then with installation of the normal saline, 
we unravel the balloon and it fills that subacromial space. You can see we're moving the humeral head below it and the balloon remains uh, stable. So here is a paper that really describes that you can even do this procedure with just fluoroscopic guidance in a non-surgical setting, even potentially uh, in the office under local anesthesia. So there's great hope, at least uh, with this device, but we have to be careful when we consider any new device and the hype around uh, a new innovation. And this is the Gartner hype curve that we typically uh, think about how a new innovation is brought uh, to market and used. So initially there's an innovation trigger, there's a peak of inflated expectations. We hope it uh, exceeds our needs really and can solve lots of different problems. But as we learn more, and as we'll try to go through today, some of the evolution of the research, the clinical research um, kind of developing over time, and that's really through the slope of enlightenment as we do more research, as we figure out what are the appropriate indications for this new device. So we can go from a trough of disillusionment potentially to an appropriate use of a new device for some of these complicated um, uh, massive rotator cup tears. So the first step I thought we would review is the biomechanics of the subacromial balloon. So the, the question really is, when we think about this balloon, what is it actually doing inside the patient? It's a very simple device. It's just filling some space. Is it just acting as a cushion? How is it acting biomechanically? Is it depressing the humeral head? And is that giving an advantage to the deltoid? Uh, is that enabling the deltoid to be retrained with physical therapy in a better way than would otherwise be the case with the simple debridement procedure, for example. So the glenohumeral anterior superior stability is very important for function and uh, powering elevation, right? So anything you can do to improve the contraction capacity of the deltoid can enhance the function of the shoulder. So maximizing this deltoid powered lever arm in a cuff deficient patient uh, has shown to be beneficial for motion as well as pain relief. So we can get rid of that uh, subacromial pain from a high riding humeral head. So this is a depiction of the contact pressures in the subacromial space in the setting of rotator cuff arthropathy. So we've lost the superior rotator cuff and you'll see these spikes of pressure that occur at different parts in the subacromial space. And you can imagine, it's not too hard to imagine that these spikes are what can cause that severe pain because the force is concentrated in a small area between the acromial bone and the humeral head bone, which is now exposed with the rotator cuff being absent. So in, this is in the rotator cuff's deficient state. So if we look at the state with the balloon placed, you can see those pressures have now evened off and leveled out. So you've reduced those peaks uh, and that's a probably the most simple um, way this balloon may be functioning inside uh, the human body. So in other words, reduced peak pressures have been demonstrated in cadaveric studies. And this is a study uh, that shows just that, that the balloon is acting uh, as a cushion itself. So they were able to show reduced peak pressures as well as wider load distribution, distributing that force on the subacromial space over a greater area and thereby uh, limiting pain clinically. So a secondary question to that, other than alleviating pain, is it does it have some capacity to protect or repair? So if it's used after a rotator cuff repair or partial repair, are there any additional benefits to that? And I think that remains to be seen. So in another cadaveric study, they compared the subacromial balloon to a sub uh, superior capsule reconstruction, which is another common procedure or technique that's used for massive rotator cuff tears. And that uh, was a direct comparison in this cadaveric study. And on the basis of these results, both techniques function to decrease superior humeral head migration and position and to restore a more normal glenohumeral joint position, as well as forces during various motion and abduction specifically. And they weren't able to find in this cadaveric study any substantial differences uh, between either technique. So what they're showing really is that an SCR and a balloon, biomechanically speaking, 
function in the very similar way. It restored the humeral head position and the functional abduction force. So which is very interesting as the SCR is a, a much uh, simpler procedure technically to perform. Um, these are further studies by Dr. Murthy um, that demonstrated uh, the intact glenohumeral contact pressure was restored at most abduction angles with the balloon in place. It also was able to restore uh, lowering of the humeral head to avoid contact with the subacromial uh, bone and it increased deltoid loads at the post-operative time. So really the balloon has been shown to be most effective in depre depressing the humeral head and restoring glenohumeral contact joint positions at a level of about 25 milliliters of uh, inflation. So you can see here in, in this diagram, there is such a thing as over tensioning uh, the balloon and increasing the amount of a chromial humeral index too much can also be detrimental to glenohumeral biomechanics as well as range of motion. So appropriate tensioning of the balloon is uh, very important. So a lot of the biomechanical research does tell us these things that we're commonly viewing the balloon as doing are feasible, at least uh, in terms of their mechanism of action. I want to shift gears now and talk a little bit more about the evolution of our clinical evidence. So when we think about uh, this, there's obviously this spectrum uh, of different types of uh, clinical evidence. And at the bottom, we just have these anecdotal reports, and that's really more hype as we develop over time and do higher, more sophisticated studies, that's when we can get into evidence and come up with some final decision-making strategies for our patients. So it's kind of nice to see, as we'll go through here, the evolution of some of the studies that came out about the balloon. Of course, initially, these were very small studies. You can see an N of two single patient studies. Just to see, these are typical pilot type studies you'll, you'll see with the new device. Really looking for safety uh, complications, not very much long-term follow-ups, nothing there is av available. And as a, one theme that you'll see with a lot of the clinical studies are, there are many additional procedures associated with doing the balloon placement. And these are typical things such as debridement, bursectomies, possible partial rotator cuff repairs, biceps tenotomy, tenodesis, acromioplasty, even AC joint resections, and so on. So it's going to be difficult to sort of sort out the marginal benefit of the balloon compared to our baseline techniques. And that's an important thing to remember. But so early on, um, in two, this came out around 2012, 2013, it was initially developed. And, um, and over the next few years, from the 2012 to 2015, we start seeing some of these early reports. Uh, which was nice, you know, you can establish that it's at least safe, there weren't any significant complications uh, or things uh, of that nature. So most of these studies looked at a cohort of patients that were 60 plus years of age, and they excluded glenohumeral osteoarthritis, and that's important uh, to remember, is that this balloon is primarily for cuff um, deficiency and not necessarily for arthropathy where it's not believed to be effective. The majority of the patients are two or more tendon tears, so massive tears with significant muscle atrophy, so little hope for direct repairs or reconstructions. So this is one of the first studies that came out in uh, 2013, now a small series, 20 patients um, noting both one and two year follow up, which is, is pretty good for an early study. Here we're looking at the total constant score, and things like pain, range of motion, activities of daily living, and strength. So, in both of these regards, the one year, two year follow up demonstrates significant improvements in the pain score, as well as moderate but good improvements with respect to range of motion, as well as strength, uh, which is interesting just from balloon placement, no direct uh, cuff repairs. But again, important to remember, biceps tenotomy was part of the, of the procedure itself. Another study uh, in the following year, 24 patients, again, looking at the constant scores, show good improvement, similar improvements that were sustained to two plus years uh, follow-up, including some improvements in strength. Now, this was the fluoroscopic guided study. So even in a, again, sort of a pilot approach to see the safety and efficacy 
and uh, in the massive rotator cuff patients. So this was in 2016. Um, the total constant score was used, again, showing good improvements from uh, pre-op scores of approximately 30 to averages uh, 60 to 70 uh, sustained to two plus years. Larger study now in uh, 2017, now getting away from some of the initial designers and developers of the technology to others that have uh, adopted this, looking at a couple of different outcome measures, the Oxford shoulder score, constant score, the numeric pain rating. Again, some associated procedures where the debridement and biceps work, showing modest improvements from 30 average to a 60 post-operative uh, average in the constant score. Another study in 2017 in arthroscopy, a similar type approach, looking at range of motion and strength, showing good uh, improvements from pre to post-operative points. Also do a two plus year uh, follow-up with reasonable improvements in pain as well. Here we do note one complication, which was a revision surgery due to migration of the spacer at the three month time point. Um, this study by Risi in 2017, also a 30 patients showing improvements in the constant score, pain and strength, as well as decreased visual analog pain scores sustained again over two years. So we're slowly getting studies up, uh, from across the world. And when we start to do this, we can look at now the ASCS score, you know, different um, types of patient reported outcomes that have been used. Important in this study, because here you see a significant improvement from 30 to some of the highest improvements, 85 score on the ASCS out of 100, right? So this is the greatest we've seen up till this point in 2017. But it's important to note the group B or the in-space group, the balloon group was placed on top of a partial reconstruction. So maybe there's some benefit to adding the balloon to a partial repair and not just instead of the repair. So as early as... Um, 2018, we already have a systematic review of these prior studies. They like, looked at a combined seven studies with 200 patients, primarily in Europe and Israel, where the product was developed uh, an elderly patient with an average fall nearing uh, two years. Complication rate was quite low, which is great to see. And then all the studies that were that did report consistent improvement in both the constant score, the ASCS score uh, over the duration of follow-up. However, all of them also underwent typical procedures, including a chromioplasty and biceps tenotomy. So we see over and over through different patient reported outcomes, numeric or visual analog pain score, constant score, Oxford shoulder, ASCS, ADLs, range of motion, everything looks pretty promising uh, with this simple uh, procedure. And maybe more importantly, it's quite safe, very few complications. There was one balloon migration uh, that led to a revision. And in our experience as well, when this balloon migrates, you're able to uh, deflate the balloon with uh, a spinal needle, for example, without having to necessarily perform a revision procedure. And that's beneficial and relates to the fact that this balloon is actually temporary. It's designed to re reabsorb over six months to 12 months. There was one report of a superficial infection, typical rates of infection that we see with any surgery. And another study did report increased pain one year after the balloon, uh, which did show some scar tissue formation. They were able to get an MRI of that particular patient. So they believe this had a potential to be a foreign body reaction to the balloon and that couldn't be ruled out. However, this, the device is made of, out of PLLA and chironolactone, and these are commonly used uh, biomaterials. So as we talked about, many additional procedures were performed in a lot of these studies that we would typically do without the balloon. So it's hard to know if these adjuvant procedures could have had a confounding effect on these results. So in summary, we can say that it's safe um, for massive cuff tears and it had good potential to serve as a bridge to subsequent to arthroplasty or even a minimally invasive alternative to arthroplasty for low demand individuals. But what was really needed at that time was a more of a randomized trial to determine if we're able to tell if the balloon can provide some added benefits to a typical biceps tenotomy or debridement or partial rotator cuff. And are these results because the balloon resorbs with time? Are they sustainable beyond the typical one to two year follow-up we saw in these early studies? So what is the longevity of these? We know that the balloon is intended to degrade over six months to one year. 
and would outcome scores decrease once the balloon is degraded? So there were very few long-term studies in that initial time period out beyond two, three years. And it would be interesting to know that specific information as we counsel our patients when they have other options such as tendon transfers as well as uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty, for example. And how do we explain if the balloon is no longer there after six months to one year, what is the long lasting effect? Is the balloon restoring the force couple of the internal external rotators of the existing rotator cuff? Or is it serving as a aid to rehabilitation to the deltoid, anterior deltoid strengthening program? Does it just help in that regard? Does it promote scarring in a certain position? What is the acromial humeral index uh, long-term? Those were at this time still questions to um, be worked out. Interestingly, in 2019, they start looking at some cost analysis. As we discussed, there's so many options for a massive rotator cuff repair. How do we know which one is the best? And certainly for most of us, cost does come into the equation, at least to uh, some extent. And this study did look at, though conservative treatment is least costly, the subacromial spacer did have a gain in terms of quality adjusted life years when performing a cost effectiveness analysis at a very reasonable additional cost, uh, which is below the standard willingness to pay threshold of 50,000 US dollars, which is frequently used in cost effectiveness uh, studies and research. So it was shown to be quite cost effective as well. So in our experience, uh, we were part of the United States trial, the FDA multi-center randomized controlled trial, because we really needed to work out um, whether a prospective trial could be done. And this is currently in submission uh, and the results should be reported in the literature uh, shortly, but it was 184 patients across 20 sites. And the key uh, of this trial was that all patients received this arthroscopic debridement, the subacromial decompression, whatever needed to be done to the biceps and so on, all patients could have that. The main difference in the study arms though, the in-space group got the balloon and the control group got a partial rotator cuff repair, a single or double row as was determined by the surgeon. So use of anchors and best possible repair was done. So all the other stuff though was consistent between the groups. So we're now we're really able to kind of narrow down what benefit are we getting from the balloon compared to a typical repair we might try to do. And the endpoint in this study was a combined endpoint. We we're trying to achieve the Western Ontario rotator cuff PRO as well as the ASCS minimal clinical important difference from baseline at six weeks and maintaining that out through 12 months postoperatively without any subsequent uh, surgical interventions and absence of any other adverse device events. So ultimately about 180 patients were randomized with uh, approximately 80 plus in each group. And there was statistic significance uh, with superior improvement or non-inferior improvement rather uh, between the two groups. So the combined efficacy time points of ASCS at six weeks and work score at 12 weeks, both maintained out to 12 months was shown. And there weren't any device related adverse events or secondary surgical procedures through that first year. Other interesting findings were the balloon group was obviously significantly faster in the operating room on average 30 minutes faster there was an earlier return to function and rehab at 12 weeks that was uh, maintained at one year. And as we would expect for massive rotator cuff tears, there was a high retear rate in the partial repair group, uh, over 80%. So in terms of longevity, uh, this paper uh, that was published last year, that we were able to look at a cohort of papers from uh, patients, excuse me, uh, in Italy over a longer time period and try to start getting at the question of longevity and how long do these results actually last. So in this study, the inclusion criteria were again, folks over 50 years of age, persistent pain with large posterior superior rotator cuff tears. And this survival analysis, you can see at one year, 92% uh, survival, and two years maintaining to 90%, out to three and four years, 87%. So this, we're starting to get an idea that even though the balloon is not in place and has resorbed out of the patient at that point with remnant scarring, you can have these clinical results last an extended period of time. 
the revisions were five that were converted to a reverse and one that was converted to a latissimus in this cohort. Again, no significant complications, though 10 patients were lost uh, to follow up. So another question is, can we um, achieve a change in the acromion humeral distance and can that change be maintained? So this is a representative x-ray of a patient before and after the subacromial balloon. So you can see that space has been elevated. And this is a 78 year old uh, individual and this is maintained out to almost four years um, in this individual anyway. Um, but as we'll see, the preoperative acromial humeral interval was approximately 7.4. Immediately postoperatively that increased by over four millimeters, but at final follow-up over long periods of time, well, the device was not able to maintain this increased acromial humeral distance. So despite the maintained clinical results, the acromial humeral interval continued to decrease with time. Uh, though the minimal clinical important difference as well as the permissible acceptable state for patients was met in 98% of cases, 75% of the patients described excellent satisfaction and only 10% were dissatisfied with the with result long-term. So predictors of a uh, final constant score were three things, a preoperative uh, constant score, as well as the um, immediate postoperative acromial humeral interval and the postoperative acromial humeral interval at final follow-up. So you can see there's actually a range of the acromial humeral interval uh, between here, maybe three and 10, or maybe less, maybe eight or nine, that is ideal for the, for the post-operative constant score. If you get too high or too low, uh, the clinical results uh, suffer. And obviously, if you do have a slightly better or moderate 20 to 40 constant score preoperatively, you're going to do better postoperatively. Some of the severe cases, this device may not be indicated for and may require a greater procedure such as the reverse shoulder. So what can we summarize about this uh, device? So the balloon, we can say it's safe. It has a good safety profile. It has a good biomechanical basis. Uh, it can do different things to achieve the clinical results. And the, those clinical results are at least non-inferior to what we typically would do, which is a partial repair and debridement, decompression, and so on. So even a randomized controlled trial was able to demonstrate some non-inferiority and a faster time in the OR. So it's less expensive potentially based on whatever this device might cost compared to the OR time and anchors and implants of a typical rotator cuff repair. Though it's much more technically easy to do. It's quick, it's easy, it doesn't require a, a, a great surgical expertise. The one study showing it could be done in a procedural setting, potentially under fluoroscopy, and a faster return to function with uh, the results of the RCT, uh, both better pain relief and uh, range of motion. That we had to compare to some of the alternatives, right? The rotator cuff repair, they're usually a um, bit more advanced with grafts or patches that are utilized, uh, superior capsular reconstruction, different types of tendon transfer or reverse. These are all riskier procedures they are longer. They also have good biomechanical basis, similarly, in terms of the lowering of the humeral head, the depression, making the deltoid more um, active. And uh, their clinical effectiveness is variable. They have, they're much more time consuming. They have greater expense. They're, uh, again, technically more demanding and complex. And it's not obviously feasible in a procedural setting. This requires uh, general anesthesia typically and um, uh, open surgery. And the rehab can be lengthy. So where does the balloon fit? When we think about our patients uh, with respect to age and frailty overall. Our young patients, of course, we're going to try to do a direct repair, patch and graft them as best we can, maintaining their native anatomy. And then if we can't do that, we consider the patches, the grafts, the superior capsule reconstructions or a tendon transfer. But as the age and frailty increase in lower demand individual, partial repairs and debridements are appropriate. Reverses can be if any arthritis is involved. But Balloon, I think, has a place here in the lower demand individual looking to avoid a larger, more invasive surgery 
maybe a very appropriate uh, technology to help this patient uh, with a very minimally invasive approach. And where it's yet to be seen how the balloon might enhance the results of some of these other techniques. Can you place the balloon on top of these partial repairs and, and improve the results uh, in that way? And of course, uh, we're still exploring the costs and how where the balloon fits in in that regard. So when we look at these different rotator cuff patterns, I would say um, the balloon is most appropriate when you have a force couple that's maintained. And if you're looking for an isolated supraspinatus or, or partial infraspinatus, uh, as we see in, in this pattern D, that's probably the best indication for the balloon where you have an intact subscapularis, you have an intact, at least inferior infraspinatus or teres to give you some balancing. Then the balloon can be placed here where the supraspinatus and partial infraspinatus are no longer viable. And that can help the recreation of the um, force couple to allow the deltoid to work. So we have many options again. And I think the balloon is probably best in this isolated circumstance in a lower demand, older individual uh, compared to a high demand, young individual where we see where we're gonna attempt partial repairs and things of that. So we do have many remaining questions, right? So we want to, to know if this device should be used in isolation versus an adjunct with our other procedures. Uh, what marginal benefit are we gonna gain from this device in addition to a partial repair? Um, and what, what do we know about the longevity after three or four years? Are we gonna see greater failure rates and need to convert to a reverse? And what about repeat use of the balloon? Can we get additional years of benefit by placing the balloon maybe after uh, three to four years uh, to avoid more invasive procedures? So lots left to learn, but uh, I think that is where we stand today with the subacromial balloon spacer. Thank you. Thank you, Yuma, for yet another brilliant talk from your side. Couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, now, Uma, if I'm right, the subacromial balloon uh, was introduced in the U.S. just a couple of three months, three to four months prior. And as you know, orthopedic surgeons have a pension for new devices, right? Uh, any new device comes into the market, an orthopedic surgeon grabs onto it. And we have been all uh, at the subject of a lot of medical journals. And I'd, I would like to take you to the paper that is published in BMJ 2014 and where they looked at five most common implants that were introduced in hip and knee arthroplasty. And they, the conclusion was that we did not find convincing high quality evidence supporting the use of five substantial, well-known and already implanted devices in orthopedics. So do you think the balloon, we need to really wait for some more time to say, okay, this is going to be, this is a classic innovation. And do we currently have high level one data? You have mentioned a lot of publications. Do we have level one data to support the use of the balloon? Yeah, so I think that um, that's why I kind of frame this discussion in that Gartner sort of hype curve for new innovation. You're, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, as orthopedic surgeons, we like our tools. And you know, when something is novel, we tend to have an inflated view of their potential to help and maybe neglect to see some of the the actual long-term benefits or the risks or something along those lines. So you have to be very careful. So I hope with this presentation, we kind of progressed and have seen how the literature and science and evidence has developed over time. Initially, you know, from, I'm not involved with this device. I didn't help develop it. I have no financial conflict with it. Um, but initially the research was from the developers as we would expect and then it slowly progressed to other areas of the world that those that didn't have involvement with the product and started with low levels you know level four level five isolated uh, reports and then you know larger case series showing the safety side not necessarily the effectiveness side so i think the company actually deserves a lot of credit for how they brought this to the market especially in the united states anyway because they did do and they funded it uh, across many US surgeons, 20 sites, uh, including Johns Hopkins, uh, to do this level one trial, a multi-center, truly randomized trial, comparing it against a lot of these things we typically do, the debridement, decompression, the biceps work, 
and the rotator cuff repairs. So there is now level one evidence that it's non inferior in terms of clinical outcomes, which is great. But now you have something very simple to do compared to our other also novel techniques like lower trapezial tendon transfer or superior capsule reconstruction. These are also new with limited uh, long term results. So the advantages of the balloon, I think, are the speed and technical ease. But we still have to figure out what are they going to charge uh, for this implant in the United States? Is it cost effective for some of these um, uh, comparative procedures? So there's still a lot of things to explore from a research perspective. There's one our, you know, randomized control trial. So I think doing more and comparing it and finding its true place. But I think it does have a place in our overall armamentarium with all these other techniques we do for a very difficult problem, which is a massive rotator cuff tear. I think the ideal candidate is that elderly, probably female, smaller, lower demand individual trying to avoid an arthroplasty or something more invasive. This can be done very quickly and potentially with very little general anesthesia. So someone that's very sick, but having a significant uh, shoulder pathology has an, now an alternate option to uh, open arthroplasty. Thank you, Uma, for that. The other question is regarding the training of the deltoid, right? For example, when we put the spacer, there are surgeons who argue that it is just, it is an implant that helps you buy time so that you train the deltoid. And in case you're unable to train the deltoid, you are going to go back to a previous scenario. For example, the acromic humeral distance reduces. And what is your take on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's certainly part of it. I think it probably functions in all of those regards. First, it's just a cushion. So maybe those little spikes of bone between the humerus and the acromion are alleviated. So that provides some of the pain relief. But if you think about what the uh, superior capsule reconstruction does, what the latissimus or lower trap tendon transfer does, and what even the reverse does, they're all lowering the humeral head uh, and to allow better deltoid function and preventing the direct contact of the top of the humerus with the acromion. So I think all those technologies are probably working the same way. And some would argue that some of these tendon transfers are in fact a, a tenodesis. It's just holding the head down. They're not actively working as a new muscle tendon unit. So if you can achieve those same results from those sets of procedures with a very simple subacromial balloon that can lower the head and then either trick your deltoid into having a better force couple long enough for some scarring to happen even after the balloon has resorbed. Um, even if it is just a temporizing procedure, I think a lot of patients and surgeons are interested in that. Some people, if you can move them from 60 year old, getting a um, reverse shoulder arthroplasty to 65, 70, I think that's a, a win for both the surgeon and patient in terms of overall management of that shoulder in a lifetime. Thank you, Uma, for that. Just one last question before we end of the session. Now, do you have any complications from this procedure? Have you encountered any of uh, complicated like migra migration, breakage, or something similar to that? And how many have you implanted in your personal practice? So during the trial, we implanted about 11 or 12. And then, you know, as it's become available here in the United States over the last few months, we've done an additional four or five. So, um, I haven't had any migration. So, and I think that the migration that has been reported, it's, it's a matter of sizing it correctly. There's three different sizes to choose from and tensioning it with enough of the volume to inflate it properly. But I think we've worked that out pretty well. But even in the worst case scenario of a, of a rare mi migration somewhere anteriorly or posteriorly, um, you actually can just deflate it if it's early on in the, in the process. Uh, and then because it's resorbable, you don't need to you know, worry about retrieving it necessarily. So I think the safety profile is quite good. And uh, those, that device specific complication is, is quite rare. Thank you, Uma. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for yet another fantastic lecture. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. All right, wonderful. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you, my boy.